the latest in a series of natural disasters that seem to be coming fast and furious. What's behind it all? Joining me now is Ken Hudson, a geophysicist for the U.S. Geological Survey, Eddie Barnard, Director Emeritus of the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, Ken, can I start with you and just ask you, uh, what do you think is going on from an expert point of view here? Well, it's uh, not the answer you want to hear, but I would say that statistical analysis would have a hard time finding a pattern here. It's a human tendency to find patterns, though, and so I think whether it's uh, people looking up at the stars and finding constellations or looking at earthquakes happening worldwide, there's a tendency to find patterns when really it's um, more or less just coincidental. And uh, there are some studies suggesting that the earthquake in Japan has caused the Earth to spin 1.6 microseconds faster, which would mean that our days become shorter. Can you explain what that means? Is, is this actually how it sounds? Sure. Uh, if you picture the plates uh, are going against one another and one is going down under, and so the mass is redistributing as a result. And so it's like an ice skater pulling their arms in closer. They'll spin faster because the mass is concentrating closer to the spin axis. Simple as that. Eddie Barnard, let me turn to you. It seems to many observers that the scale and ferocity of these natural disasters has increased dramatically over the last decade. I is that correct, or is this a cyclical thing? What, what do you think is happening here? Well, I, I think Ken has a good point that uh, if you looked at the geological history of this area, uh, there's been uh, repeated uh, tsunamis generated in the Sendai area. There was a large one in 1856, a, another one in 1933, and now one in 2011. Uh, this is a very geologically active area, and it generates tsunamis frequently. Uh, and I would, did want to sort of remind your viewing audience that the word tsunami is a Japanese word. It's a compound word, su, which means harbor, and nami, which means wave. And as the Japanese were developing their country, uh, they couldn't build on the coastline because of the severe storms. And so what they did was they would, uh, their fishing boats would go up into a harbor, up into a river. And uh, when they would see these unusual waves in a harbor, they'd call them tsunami. And that's uh, now, however, in the last uh, 100 years, they've developed more along the coastline than they did in the past. And as a result of this development, uh, when there is a tsunami, you see the effects of, uh, of this carnage that, that uh, all your viewers have been seeing uh, unfold today through the videos. Let me bring in Neil deGrasse Tyson here. From an astrophysics point of view, some people are blaming the moon. Uh, is this complete nonsense, or is there any kind of credence to that theory? Uh, it's complete nonsense, but I don't like saying it's nonsense without defending why it is so. The people like to blame, first, there's this urge to blame the cosmos for things that happen on Earth. That, that's a strong urge that's been going on since time began. And so that's, that's the psychology of it. But the moon spends part of its orbit closer to Earth and other parts of its orbit farther away. So its orbit is not a perfect circle, it's an ellipse. When the moon is closer, the gravitational attraction between Earth and moon is stronger than when it's farther away. That sounds natural. Another phenomenon is tides. Tides are strongest during full moon and new moon than they are during the quarter phases. Right now, it's the quarter moon. And so it's the weakest configuration for a tide stress, number one. Number two, the moon is not at its closest point to Earth, as it would be every month, by the way. So, so it's time to simply blame the fact that this region is geologically active, as is the entire ring of fire that is the perimeter of the Pacific Ocean that extends down from Chile up through the west coast of South America and North America, the Aleutian Islands, and all the way back down into Asia. And so, uh, and another important point that I think hasn't been raised, we can speak of how damaging, we can speak of how strong an earthquake is. That's one thing, you can keep the record of what those are. Another thing is how devastating it is to our civilizations. And that's the juxtaposition of the the, 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 where the earthquake takes place with where there are population centers. And so when I think of devastating earthquakes, I'm not really ranking just what the most powerful ones are. I want to see where they happen 
And when they happen near population centers, that's where you have your greatest disaster. Neil, let me bring uh, in Ken Hunnell again, because we're getting breaking news that another aftershock uh, registering 6.8 magnitude has just hit Japan. Uh, Ken, what is your reaction to that? And are we going to see more and more of these? Is this one of the inevitable repercussions of an earthquake that size? Well, aftershocks do follow some general patterns and can be statistically analyzed. Uh, what we would expect to see is a fall off in the number of aftershocks and in the severity of aftershocks with time. Um, for a magnitude 8.9 like this main shock, it would not be surprising to have an aftershock even as large as magnitude 7.9 in the upcoming weeks. And um, we're always concerned too, we've just relearned the lesson again in New Zealand that a large late aftershock close to a population center can be especially damaging. So um, although aftershock statistics are well understood, Sometimes um, it may seem quite surprising, but these large late aftershocks can really pack a, a hard punch. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for your expert opinion there. Much appreciated. When we come back, the nuclear picture and an incredible survival story.